Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Sermapod. This is the podcast for the Sports and Entertainment Risk Management Alliance. I am the host of the Sermapod and also the founder and CEO of Serma, Rich Lenkoff. And uh, we are covering today with an esteemed panel of guests and experts in the subject, the recent unfortunate cancellation of three Taylor Swift concerts that were supposed to take place in Vienna that were canceled because of a risk of a terrorist threat that was uh, uncovered, thankfully, before the show. I happened to be in Vienna last week preparing to go to the first show with my niece. I will say that I, I was not going, fellas, as a grown adult male on my own. I was going with my female niece. Not that there's anything wrong with going to a Taylor Swift on your own, um, but uh, we'll cover that subject. So we'll get started here. I'll let our guests, two of whom we're very happy and proud to call Surma Advisory Board members. Jason, why don't you lead us off and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Rich. Jason DeMarco, head of the MGA and VP of underwriting at Players Health, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Another advisory board member, Shalom. Shalom, go ahead. Thanks, Rich. Shalom, Sunula. Um, working with USI as an insurance broker. I'm happy to be here. Interesting topic. And Ryan, you are Shalom's partner. Uh, you've been with us for a while. You've done some other content for us. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Rich. Uh, yeah, I've been with uh, USI and predecessor companies for near 20 years and been in the business for 24 and uh, love what we're doing in the sports practice and uh, appreciate our opportunities to connect with the CERMA uh, membership and, and, and group. Thank you so much. USI has been an incredible partner and real leader in the space. We appreciate you being here. So, fellas, I'll give our listeners and viewers some context. Uh, I am a proud Swifty, have been for many years. I've got a 20-year-old daughter, just turned 20. So Taylor's been in my life for, you know, most of her life. She is a huge Swifty. And, uh, you know, we've got, we've been privileged enough to go to a few concerts. Uh, and, you know, huge fan of Taylor Swift, big talent. So I was volunteering through one of our, with the help of one of our other advisory board members, Jess Meckley, for uh, Team USA at the Paris Olympics. I was lucky enough to help with some of the athletes and training. And of course, when I realized that Taylor Swift was going to be a short plane ride away in Vienna, I extended my time in Europe to uh, go to the Taylor Swift concert. I've got a 22 or so year old niece who uh, was going to be in Paris at the same time. So we decided, let's go. We bought tickets. Um, tickets, as you know, are remarkably cheaper in Europe and overseas. So to give you some context, fellas, I paid only a week before the show. We bought tickets in the GA section of the Mass of Vienna um, Stadium. It's, you know, an Olympic-sized stadium. I think it probably holds something like 95,000 people or so, maybe a little less, but, you know, a, a large stadium. I bought tickets in the GA section next to the stage for $500. I think it was like $550. Um, to give you some context, in the U.S. and her next leg in North America, those same tickets in, like, Toronto, and Miami, those cost about eight thousand dollars. So we got a pretty good deal. We were really excited. Um, it was pretty easy to get those tickets actually that late. And uh, I arrived. I was I was leaving. Let's see. I was in Milan on a stopover. And as I was waiting for my plane from Milan to Vienna, I got an alert. Like literally millions of people on the earth got the alert that there was a terrorist threat at the Taylor Swift concert. And at that time, guys, the news was that it had been discovered and there was two or three people arrested and that, importantly, the show was going to go on, was going to proceed. So, you know, we let out a big sigh of relief that, number one, first and foremost, this had been uh, this threat had been uh, caught and discovered and um, and, and they 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 discovered it. Right. Um, but obviously, given today's circumstances and, and what we all know about these events, in the back of my head, I thought it could be difficult to proceed with this concert given the, given the continued threat. Because in that same alert, they said that they are still looking at things. Well, lo and behold, less than an hour later, we got the first alert that it had been canceled. Now, that was not officially from Taylor Swift. But, you know, uh, it got quickly picked up by a million different TikTok accounts and 
Shortly thereafter, we had the news that Taylor Swift had canceled the concert because of additional threats and some additional investigation. So, of course, the concert was canceled, and that leads us to today. So we'll start off by perhaps talking about how these things are decided at the ground level, guys. You're all in the space, um, not necessarily on the promotion side, but you've been familiar with the space. How does that decision-making happen? What, you know, what event is enough to trigger a cancellation? Because let's face it, there are millions and millions of dollars involved in one of these shows, thousands of people, security, personnel, um, you know, all of the attendant personnel who uh, help put on a show, not to mention the, I think, 195,000 fans that were supposed to attend these three shows. So it's a big decision. So what level of threat when it comes to terrorism, what level of weather threats, other conditions um, trigger a cancellation only, you know, a day before a show? Anyone want to jump on that one? Sure. I mean, I'll pick it up. So I guess there's two different types of cancellation insurance. So you go if we start with like the event, obviously the one that would be triggered here, it covers exp expenses for special events like weddings, anniversaries, obviously concerts, uh, and it could be because of weather, a death, um, a, a vendor fails to do something uh, or to provide a certain service. So that's the event side of it. And then you go into the trip cancellation, which obviously this is going to play a factor as well, because individuals that may be on your way, like you, Rich, you may say, I'm going to cancel this trip so that you have hotel reservations that you're probably not going to be reimbursed for because you didn't find out in enough time. So those are the two uh, triggers here. One is obviously uh, the event and the other one is the, the trip. So for this particular one, there's a couple different questions that kind of came to mind right off the bat is... One, will it be rescheduled? So that was the first question that I had, um, because that definitely will limit, uh, and I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit more. And then did, what kind of insurance was actually provided? So, and also who canceled it? Was it Taylor Swift or was it the event uh, promoter, uh, which is Barracuda Music, which is a music uh, promoter in uh, that particular area? And in this case, from the little research that I did on it, it appears that it was barracuda music. So I think we could kind of go there. I'm not sure who wants to answer kind of some of the questions that I laid out there. But to that point, Ray, it's a great, great starting point. So Ryan Shulm, to that point, who typically purchases cancellation insurance? Is it the promoter of barracuda? In this case, is it the artist? Is it the venue? There's lots of different parties that could be liable. Do they all purchase it? Um, what do you What do you know about that? Well, my understanding is all, yes, you're right, all can purchase it, right? Because they all have things that they want to protect. Um, I guess, Jason, you know, as you were talking there, one of the things that came to mind was just from an underwriter's perspective, Lloyd's in this case, right, who typically, uh, you know, are, are pretty heavy hitters in this space is well, like one of the questions that came to mind, has there been a cancellation? Right? Has any of Taylor Swift's uh, concerts has she experienced a cancellation before? That's definitely something that underwriters take into consideration. Um, and then, what are the potential triggers of cancellation? And I think threats or safety threats or acts of terrorism typically sometimes are, are viewed as included within that event cancellation sort of coverage. But for some underwriters, it is a buy-up feature. Um, but yeah, definitely some interesting. Sir. Yeah, and if, if you take it even maybe a little bit more granular, the the goal of event cancellation can be one of two kind of underwriting and and true response uh, coverages to the form itself. So when you are going through the underwriting process, you're going to be asked, do you want to cover just your expense component, or do you want to cover both expense and revenue. So you you basically, you, do you want to build in your margin? Um, so getting back to the kind of underlying question of who buys it is whoever has exposure to the event needs to electively procure the coverage. Conceivably, the largest entity in the hosting of the event, that being the one with the, the largest stake in it, uh, probably the Taylor Swift side, 
they could conceivably buy a policy that is for themselves and the production company and list both as named insureds and then it's a collective buy. Um, but really at getting at that granular level, I think it's important um, to also recognize smaller events, it tends to not be cost effective to buy event cancellation for a couple of reasons. There's a deductible associated with it. Well, what's the deductible? The deductible is often, you know, one concert. So if she has three concerts, she probably has a pretty significant deductible uh, associated with that. So, um, you know, food for thought for, you know, more, more, more in depth conversation that we can have in, in this Sermapod. Well, Ryan, you, you raise a really interesting question and without getting too much in the weeds about how underwriters work, because, you know, that's might not be the most compelling discussion for our listeners and readers, but I am interested in knowing how underwriters and, and carriers, you know, put together a quote, how they quantify something as different and, you know, far reaching as a concert. Everyone is different. Every one of these concerts is somewhat different, although I suspect that they look at sort of different classes of, of artists and things, but, you know, it's probably somewhat unique in terms of quantifying what the policy is and, and how much you're going to pay for that. Right. And, and part of that, by the way, has to be how successful the artist is in putting on shows. Taylor Swift is well known to not miss many shows, right? She's famous for playing these rain shows where she's literally standing there in the rain performing, you know, shows where others would easily cancel there. So anyone want to sort of explain in layman's terms to the extent that you can, how carriers put together these quotes and how they look at these different factors and quantifying how much to, to charge? Yeah, as, as the boring underwriter, I'll, I think I'll take that one. Um, <laughs> So when I, when I first looked at this, I started to do some deep dive into kind of what the policy is. So it, what I found out from my research is that Taylor Swift policy is for, is triggered by a full cancellation of her tour. So it's not covered by individual shows that are canceled. Ooh. So if the trigger is a full tour, and in this case, I think it was the error tour. If it was a, if it was canceled in its entirety, then that would be the trigger. Now, there could be additional language within there that says if it's similar to what Shalom said, if it's a uh, terrorist attack usually isn't covered or, or militant um, type of attacks usually aren't covered. However, Lloyd's has a tendency to, if it's a good risk and they want, you could always add it back in at a cost. Uh, I don't have the policy, so I can't speak to it uh, particularly, but uh, the overall risk, similar to what you said, Rich, she doesn't miss very many tours. So from an underwriter, I'm saying she doesn't miss very many tours. It's going to be massive. She's going internationally. And I was like, the premium on it is going to be pretty sizable. And realistically, I think that it's a pretty good risk overall. If so I was underwriting it from an event cancellation standpoint. All right. So picking up on that, how much does the venue, the location play into it? Because this was canceled because of a terrorist, an ISIS terrorist threat in Vienna. Now I'm no expert on terrorism, but you don't typically think of Vienna as a high risk situation for terrorist attacks. So I'm sure that goes into it. If on the other hand, you're holding, you know, a concert in an area that is well known for terrorist threats or even Paris, like for example, during the Olympics, yeah. that's a more high level risk and therefore, you know, it would be a more expensive policy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when you're talking about if it's, in London, obviously, uh, she's in London, what, next week? Yes. And if, if it's held in London, you would think that they've had a, uh, terrorist attacks in the past, might be a slightly uh, elevated exposure, but Vienna is not what I consider high level. Uh, so, yes, I, you would look at her tour, where she's going, identify the individual risk. You might even perform like a kidnap and ransom type of exposure risk profile on her and the event. So you could kind of get, is this a... Is this a red zone? Is this a green zone? Is this a yellow zone? And then from there, you could kind of price it out. Maybe she has some, a lot of green, I, I assume, and then a lot of yellow. 
I don't think any of her current tours are in what I would quantify as like a red zone. So yeah. again, I would say it's still probably a pretty good risk. Uh, with somebody of, you know, an artist of Taylor Swift's caliber and the, the security that she has, um, I'm sure that is a part of the underwriting due diligence, right? Uh, and, and, you know, what does that diligence, due diligence look like um, from a response standpoint? And definitely something that's taken into consideration uh, to underwriting consideration as well. I'll, I'll add more often than not, underwriters are keying in on weather, especially for outdoor venues. Um, so you'd ask Rich about kind of how, how are these actually underwritten? So it gets quite granular um, in that they will look at the week that you're, that the event is to be taken on and they will look at They'll go back to entities like NOAA in the United States um, and, and look at uh, predictive weather modeling uh, mm. to evaluate the likelihood of rain, wind, hail, other storms, um, and, and price your uh, purchase of event cancellation accordingly. When we're doing, let's say, um, you know, for a sports league, you will see vast differences in cost and your ability to buy these policies is pretty a la carte. If you said, gosh, I'm not too worried about Dallas, but we've got to, you know, we're, we're going to Houston the next weekend. We may opt to buy in for the coverage at Houston, but just like we want to buy coverage in Houston because it's maybe closer to the coast, the pricing in Houston will be proportionally higher if during that time of year it is seen as a more risky, um, uh, you know, date from a weather perspective, a really good underwriter will even begin to understand uh, the surface in which they're playing on. So if it's natural surface versus artificial, um, specific for, for sport, and then if venues, let's say for entertainment, have the ability to close, um, certainly limits the the weather aspect of the underwriting. I'm going to add just one more piece, though. Lloyd's of London is is probably the, the the most ideal market for something like this, especially for a Taylor Swift, because to your point, Rich, you'd, I think you'd asked, you know, how do they how do they underwrite it? How do they price it? Our domestic markets are really good at pricing out things that they have statistics for that they have, you know, they're able to come in and determine a pretty pretty accurate loss pick for something. This is more off the cuff, and this is individuals feeling comfortable. And Lloyd's of London is that old traditional insurance uh, marketplace by which you, you get one or two uh, syndicates that price something that build out the policy form, and they want to get behind it. And then they go find support from other Lloyd's syndicates in, in London uh, to build out this package uh, to, to cover it. So... Uh, they're literally taking risks themselves. It would be like us four all having, if we were wealthy enough, all having and saying, okay, let's, you know, I, I want to hedge a bet. I think, you know, if, if I'm going to get behind anybody, it's Taylor Swift, we're going to put our money in and pool and, and be the entity that covers her and that actual activity. So um, Lloyd's of London is so unique in, in their, in those capabilities, especially for events like this. So, yeah, that really interesting points, Ryan, and, and what you said about the granular detail that you have to go into if you're really accurately assessing the risk, you know, when it comes to writing a policy that might include acts of terrorism or militant threats, you have to have access to intelligence, I assume, that the layperson doesn't have. So how much, you know, uh, research do you have to put in to determine whether there is a risk, number one, number two, does that change? I mean, if you write a policy at the beginning of Taylor Swift tour, which was like a year ago, and the world changes, how do you deal with, I mean, do you, do you tear up the policy? Do you, I mean, how, how does that work? Yeah, well, well, sadly, you can't tear up the policy uh, as, as much as I would like to at, at different points of time, because we, we are uh, appointed with Lloyd's and, and we are a syndicate. So it's, uh, it's interesting because they, they are a very unique group. And the one thing I will say um, about looking at 
terrorism as a whole, especially when you're talking about a global event, you, there are several different uh, factors that play into it, but there's also a lot of, a lot of re, uh, resources available at an underwriter's fingertips that can actually give you exactly what the threat level is uh, six months from now. I mean, obviously things could change, but realistically, if you're going to, and it, it, like I kind of mentioned like the, the green and the yellow and the red zone, usually those don't change very often. Even if, a, if it's a, an attack just happened in uh, Houston or an attack just happened in London, if it's, still, if it's a yellow, it's still going to remain a yellow because it's not something that's systemic. It's not something that is ordinarily going to happen. So you still have to price it based off of its historical data, not where it is at that, at that particular time. All right. So it's estimated that the exposure here could be in the tens of millions of dollars. Likely is that who's getting paid? I mean, who are the recipients and, and who's paying who basically? Rich, I think you cut out a little bit towards the tail end. Oh, sorry. I mean, my question is, you know, who is paying who? Who's getting paid and who's paying? What if I was to hedge my bets? I would have thought that they would have chosen the revenue side, right? Ryan mentioned earlier, you can either choose the expense or revenue, you know, either covering the cost of putting on the event uh, or tour in this case, as Jason mentioned, um, or it's the revenue side now, I, you know, the, 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 the reimbursement of tickets arguably would have been the largest line item there. And, and so, I mean, to all the, you know, including yourself, Rich would have got reimbursed tickets. And so the payout on that uh, definitely would have been a part of that uh, sort of payout to, to, to the, to the uh, participants. Well, yeah, at the beginning, I kind of brought up event cancellation and trip cancellation. So the trip cancellation obviously would go to the individual that booked that particular trip. And that would reimburse their their flights. And this is like when you go on to your airline of choice and they say, do you want to protect this particular trip? That's where trip insurance uh, would come in. And that could be for your hotel. That could be for um, your uh, plane ride. And then the event would actually be reimbursed by, in this case, based off of what I was reading by Barracuda Music, because they're the ones that canceled uh, the concert. However... Taylor Swift, if she has another policy besides for the one that's for the entire uh, tour, that's triggered by the entire tour, then if she has that other policy that could be something for individuals, then yes, I would, it's similar to what Shalom said, I would pick the revenue aspect of that because she's still making her money at the end of the day. All right. So last question I have for you before our special last question is um, from a exposure perspective beyond what is paid through claims, is there any risk of, you know, exposure from lawsuits? We cover these lawsuits all the time. You know, when an artist is late, Madonna very famously has been sued multiple times, Guns N' Roses, uh, because they are notoriously, they come on late and you see people suing for damages just from that, from having to wait a couple hours. So there's going to be, I imagine, a flood of lawsuits from people who are, as we just discussed, claiming not just lost expenses that weren't reimbursed, like travel, like meals, like hotels, but pain and suffering, mental anguish, all these things that you see from just people being late. There will be lawsuits. Now, many of those will be you know, um, probably frivolous and not pursued or not, not um, you know, allowed to be pursued. But what do you think of any exposure through, through litigation? Well, fortunately, it's not the U.S., um, <laughs> uh, but up, up, up. no, um, I mean, it's certainly a risk, um, you know, where event cancellation policies, you have to be really careful in how you manuscript them. It could be extremely easy to have terrorism included. Um, but only react when there is a, an actual act. So there was, you know, uh, not just the threat of. So you have to be really careful in how those policies respond. Uh, certain different types of weather um, can or cannot be included and excluded. In a negligence case, you have to defend yourself until you're out of that lawsuit. Now, here's the benefit. 
most of our general liability policies will cover us for defense of negligence and until it's proven that we were not and that it was you know a frivolous lawsuit so um if it gets to the point of this being litigious or, or uh, you know uh, lawsuits and uh, you know claims of negligence there's going to be good protection for taylor swift uh and or the promoter uh through their insurance policies where i think the bigger question is is you know were the event cancellation policies broad enough to protect what was the deductible you know like i said in most cases the deductible is at least one if not the whole three days um of, of concert so what do we think? Well, do we think Swifties are litigious? Are they, uh, or are they never, ever, never gonna sue their favorite artist? <laughs> well, the price is that high, maybe <laughs> for a ticket. <laughs> We're back, and here is the very shirt I was wearing that day. I wore it with pride that day around Austria, even though there was no show. But I met a lot of uh, Swifties. This is from the, uh, this is from the Eras tour. Let's see. That wow. so, um, yeah, we'll have to we'll have to as a group, guys, go to the next show. Um, I think uh, Jason's gonna, Jason, you get the tickets this time. Okay, I'll take, I'll take care of them next tour. As long as it's not in the U.S., I'm fine. There you go. Let's go around the horn and get the favorite Taylor Swift song from each of our guests. Jason, you're a huge oh, yeah. Give us your favorite. Taylor, Swift. gotta look it up. Uh, this is a tough one. Uh, I think I'm gonna have to go with a love story just because it's my daughter's favorite there you go the song about taylor swift i think it's like so high school i don't know second favorite those are good ones ryan you've got one no googling i shall on my seat i just needed to get the 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 name of the song all right ryan what do you got i'll go with uh cruel summer that Uh, was mine uh, that was mine (laughs) for the show Shalom, what do you got? That can't be. You got a second one? All right. Um, Say uh, blank space, maybe. No, <laughs> no, no, no. There, there is one I really like. Uh, you could go back country. You could, even, you could even go country. Yeah, we'll edit it out. We'll just we'll put in a voiceover <laughs> saying my favorite. Just say these words. My favorite Taylor Swift song is, and then I'll just fill in the blank. Shalom. Well, Shake It Off is, is a great There you go. Song. Yeah. <laughs> Way I mean, to go. When that comes on... <laughs> Way to go on a limb and take a deep cut, uh, shake it up. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of favorites, but my favorite from this particular concert is a song called The Man, which is incredible. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll have to go do another show together uh, when Taylor Swift comes back stateside, which is shortly. This is her last leg of the European tour this week, so uh, we'll do it. But big thanks to Jason, Shalom, and Ryan. Uh, for joining us and discussing this very timely and important subject. Guys, thank you so much, and please come back in the future on the Sermopod. Sounds good. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Thanks, Rich.